Today's episode is sponsored by News Voice. As we talk about frequently, media consolidation poses an enormous danger to democracy, so while we all continue to push for effective antitrust enforcement, News Voice has come up with an immediate response to this problem. News Voice is a website and app for iOS and Android, which you can access for free if you go to newsvoice.com best. It gives you a personalized news feed by aggregating a mix of mainstream, international, and independent media sources, all based on on crowdsourcing and a democratized upvote system. Plus, they also have a video interview series featuring guests such as Chris Hedges and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Check it out for yourself by downloading the app for free by going to newsvoice.com best. And now, welcome to this episode of the award-winning Best of Left podcast, in which we shall learn about the economics, sexism, and racism embedded in the restaurant industry, largely due to the practice of tipping. Clips today come from Splinter, Counterspin, Start Making Sense, Bite, Pod Save the People, and Messy Mouthy Mandatory. If you eat at a restaurant in the U.S., you're expected to tip. It's just the right thing to do. But what if I told you that tipping has a racist past? And it's not just because black waiters get smaller tips than their white co-workers, or that the tipped minimum wage just makes the poor poorer. It's that the custom of tipping in America was racist from the very beginning, and it goes all the way back to slavery. Tipping started among European aristocrats in the 17th century. Rich Americans adopted the practice in the mid-1800s, and it spread throughout the country after the Civil War. Here's why. According to research by activist Saru J. Raman, newly freed slaves were flocking to major cities to find work. But they were only hired for jobs that were considered unskilled, mostly in restaurants. Racist restaurant owners embraced tipping as a way to hire free slaves without actually having to pay them any wages. And customers were down with this new practice because they believed it was natural to tip their inferiors. Racism and classism run deep. This attitude is summed up in this passage by a reporter in 1902. I had never known any but Negro servants. Negroes take tips, of course. One expects that of them. It is a token of their inferiority. But to give money to a white man was embarrassing to me. By the late 1880s, black workers accounted for nearly half of the hospitality industry. Then in the 20s, restaurants that were losing money because of prohibition laws encouraged tipping, making it even more popular. Over time, tipping became the norm. And thanks to the powerful lobbying of the restaurant industry, in 1938, Congress passed America's first minimum wage law, allowing states to set a lower wage for tipped workers. In 1996, the then head of the National Restaurant Association, Herman Cain, convinced a Republican-led Congress to set a two-tiered wage system for tipped and non-tipped workers. The tipped minimum wage was set at $2.13 per hour. Today, in 17 states, the legal minimum wage for tipped workers is still only $2.13 per hour. A century later, the inherent racism of tipping persists. Non-white restaurant workers take home 56% less than their white peers. And now, there's a new demographic that's suffering. Women. According to J.R. Rahman, almost 66% of the 6 million tipped workers in America are women. Europe, where this whole thing began, has long moved past tipping to pay restaurant workers a full wage. So maybe it's time for America to change its tipping culture too. The truth of the matter is, this is a big deal, says Simon King, general manager of The Modern, a high-end restaurant attached to the Museum of Modern Art in Manhattan. He's referring to the decision by Danny Meyer, owner of The Modern and many other restaurants, to phase out what the New York Times called the time-honored American practice of tipping. 
That such a time-honored practice is now being challenged has a lot to do with our guest and her work. Saru Jayaraman is the co-founder and co-director of the Restaurant Opportunity Centers United and director of the Food Labor Research Center at the University of California, Berkeley. She's author of the book Behind the Kitchen Door and the upcoming Forked, A New Standard for American Dining. She joins us now by phone from California. Welcome to Counterspin, Saru Jayaraman. Thank you. Great to be here. Well, tipping and the tipped wage is not the only issue facing restaurant workers, but let's start there. What do you think people don't understand about the way that practice works and its impact on workers? (laughs) I think most people know almost nothing at all about this issue, including legislators in the highest levels of office. We've had to do a lot of education with people on the issue, and I'll say even me, myself, until about 10 years ago, really beginning to work in this industry and with workers across the country, knew very little myself. I think the big thing people should know is that it is the second largest and fastest growing sector of our economy, but pays the absolute lowest paying wages in the country. And uh, that is due to the money, power, and influence of a trade lobby called the National Restaurant Association, which leads the Fortune 500 chains, restaurant chains in our country. And whose power dates back over a 100 years to the emancipation of the slaves um, when they essentially first fought for the right to not pay workers anything, especially former slaves who were the first tipped workers in our country, not pay them anything and let them live on customer tips. And there's just such a such a great deal of mis- misinformation about who those workers are today even. You know, there's such a misperception that the Restaurant Association likes to promote that these are very well-paid, tipped workers, white guys working in fancy fine dining restaurants, when in fact the vast majority of tipped workers in America, 70% in fact, are women who work at IHOP and Applebee's and Olive Garden and earn a median wage of $9 an hour, including tips, uh, and suffer from three times the poverty rate of the rest of the U.S. workforce and the highest rates of sexual harassment of any industry in the United States because they are forced to live in large part on tips rather than receiving a wage from their employer. Well, some of the defenses of tipping that are that are being brought out now uh, really reflect that kind of feudal um, attitude. Richard Cohen at the Washington Post writes, quote, I like to reward, but occasionally I like to punish, close quote. <laughs> I, I mean... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it really gets at something, I think, at a kind of the, the baseline and, and, it, and telling you, hearing you say the origins of it really are, it really does come from that kind of attitude that people should serve at your pleasure. Yeah. That's right. And let me be clear, because, you know, what I really appreciate about your show and program is, you know, really clearing up what maybe other media sources have conflated, you know, our fight. Our campaign is not actually at this minute to eliminate tipping altogether. That's a huge misconception. We are trying to eliminate the lower wage for tipped workers, which this industry has gotten away with for over a hundred years. The the true history is that tipping originated in Europe. When it came to the United States in the late 1850s, there was a massive anti-tipping movement so great that five states passed bans on tipping. And two industries, the restaurant industry and the Pullman train company, squashed that movement and demanded the right to hire newly freed slaves and not pay them anything and let them live on customer tips. And that idea that the restaurant industry in particular could not pay its workers a wage and let them live on customer tips was codified into the very first minimum wage law as part of the New Deal, which gave tipped workers the right to a $0 minimum wage. And we've gone from $0 in 1938 to a whopping $2.13 an hour, which is the federal minimum wage for tipped workers in our country. Now, there are seven states that have completely eliminated that system and demand that the restaurant industry actually pay its workers a full wage and let tips be on top of that. California, Oregon, Washington, Nevada, Minnesota, Montana, and Alaska all demand that the restaurant industry pay a full wage and let tips be on top. And so our campaign, our effort has been to eliminate that lower wage for tipped workers, that two-tiered system that's essentially legalized gender pay inequity because it's mostly women living on the lower wage. Our fight is to eliminate that lower wage for tipped workers everywhere across the country, not 
at this minute to eliminate tipping. There are restaurants that have chosen to follow our lead and eliminate the lower wage for tipped workers in their restaurants by eliminating tipping. And if they're doing it in a transparent way that makes their workers whole, then we are fully in support of that. But right now we feel that, you know, as long as we're talking about minimum wages in this country of 10 and 12 and $15 an hour, that's actually not enough to live on anywhere in this country. And so tips are absolutely necessary at this moment on top of a wage to get workers closer to something livable. But what we don't want is what we have right now, which is that those tips can be counted against wages so that, in essence, most workers in this industry, in this country, are living almost entirely on customer power, on that sort of power to punish and or reward, rather than on a base wage from their employer like every other industry has to provide. Well, let me ask you as a point of information, because when outlets like the New York Times and USA Today print articles about the tipped wage, as a matter of course, they get a letter from a representative of the National Restaurant Association right. that says no one gets a sub-minimum wage because if wait staff don't get enough from tips plus that $2.13 an hour to get up to minimum wage, the employer tops it off. Now, is that yeah. <laughs> the law but not the case? That's exactly not the case. And so the U.S. Department of Labor reports an 80%, 80% violation rate with regard to this issue of employers having to make up the difference hour by hour and ensure that tips actually bring you to the full minimum wage. I mean, it's, you know, I feel for employers, it's an extraordinary burden to have to ensure hour by hour. It takes, you know, a lot of accounting and HR, which most small businesses don't have. It's a tremendous burden on small businesses. And I will say, actually, this is partly why so many employers have started to move in our direction, why we're seeing so much industry shift on this issue is because even some employer side attorneys have come out saying this is tremendous liability and burden on small businesses in particular that have to calculate this difference or get sued. So it doesn't happen. It's a huge liability, but really fundamentally on top of that, I want to say even if there was a hundred percent compliance, which this issue, which there obviously isn't, it still wouldn't work because when you're a woman who lives off of tips for the majority of your income as 6 million women in America do, you have to tolerate whatever a customer might do to you, however they may touch you or treat you or talk to you because the customer is always right because the customer is paying all of your income truly because your wage is so low. If you get 2 or 3 or $4 an hour as it is in 43 states, your wage is so low it goes entirely to taxes and you're living completely off your tips. So if you're living completely off your tips, you're completely dependent on the whims of the customer and you have to tolerate this kind of behavior. And our research shows it goes a step further. We found that management in states with lower wages for tipped workers encourages women to objectify themselves, wear tighter clothing, show greater cleavage in order to get more money in tips at three times the rate as they do in states like California, where a woman actually gets a full wage and doesn't have to rely on the whims of a customer. I mean, you know, that absurd comment by the Washington Post reporter, uh, you know, in any other industry, any other service profession that we interact with daily, from retail to getting gas to anything that we do that where we interact with customer service, if we're not pleased with service, we have the right to go to management and complain. And that is how it should be in this industry, too. We have the right to go to management and complain. But a woman's ability to pay her bills and not have to sell her body and feed her family should not be dependent on the whims of customers. It should be dependent on her employer who supposedly employs her and has the responsibility to ensure that she's actually paid for the work that she does. 
now for the midterms minute, a look at the candidates and races that you need to know about, shout about, and support to make sure we have a blue tsunami on November 6th. The primaries are over, the candidates are set, and now it's time to focus on the big picture fight. Everything we do between now and election day should be done while keeping the most vulnerable and disenfranchised among us in mind. We've included links to volunteer resources in the show notes, as well as those for Swing Left and the Democratic Party's Red to Blue program for the races we'll be mentioning today so you know how to help. You can also view every battleground race at bestoftheleft.com slash activism. Today we're talking about the battleground races in Minnesota. Although Clinton won Minnesota, it was only by 1.5 percent. With the highest voter turnout in the country, 2016 was the closest presidential election in the state since 1984 and the first time the state had ever voted more Republican than the national average. There are only eight districts in Minnesota, but five of them are battlegrounds this year, making it one of the five states that will decide the majority in the House. But Minnesota also has a hotly contested Senate race this year to fill Al Franken's seat. Lieutenant Governor and Democrat Tina Smith was appointed to fill the vacancy when Franken stepped down after misconduct allegations. Smith will now face Republican Karen Housley in a special election this November. The Cook Political Report has this race rated as leaning Democratic. Now on to the House. In Minnesota's 1st District, Democrat Tim Waltz is not seeking re-election because he's running for governor. Now, former Obama administration official and Democrat Dan Feehan will be facing Republican Jim Hagedorn, who's been working hard to scare voters by calling Feehan a radical leftist for socialized medicine, a policy that literally no politicians are advocating for. Obama won here by two points in 2012, but Trump surged to win by 15 points in 2016. The Republicans are targeting this district, and the race is considered a toss-up. In Minnesota's second district, Democrat Angie Craig faces freshman Republican incumbent Jason Lewis for the second time. The two faced each other in the 2016 election, in which Lewis won by just two percentage points. Lewis has been called out for sexist and racist statements made on his radio show in 2012, but excused them by saying it was his job to be provocative. The district is extremely competitive, since Obama just barely won here in 2012, and Trump just barely won here in 2016, so it's no surprise that this race is rated as a toss-up. In Minnesota's 3rd District, businessman and Democrat Dean Phillips is facing Republican incumbent Eric Paulson. Phillips has been endorsed by End Citizens United, while Paulson has the support of Paul Ryan. Misleading GOP-funded attack ads are trying to paint Phillips as a hypocrite on health care despite reality. Clinton won this district by 10 points, and it's currently rated as a toss-up. In Minnesota's 8th district, Democratic incumbent Rick Nolan is not seeking re-election. Democrat and former state rep Joe Radinovich faces St. Louis County Commissioner Pete Stauber. In a recent New York Times poll, the race was neck and neck, with Radinovich up by 1%. The GOP is also throwing big money at this race since Trump won the district. This race is currently rated as a toss-up. And finally, the race for governor of Minnesota is also neck and neck for a seat last held by a Democrat. Democrat and former 1st District Rep Tim Waltz is facing Republican Jeff Johnson, who has been endorsed by Trump. In the previous 10 gubernatorial elections in Minnesota, six have resulted in the seat-changing party hands. This race is currently rated as leaning Democratic. If you want to vote in the Minnesota midterm elections, your online and paper registration must be received by October 16th. Minnesota does offer election day registration and voting, but if you don't have to wait, don't. Absentee ballot requests should be made by Monday, November 5th, and completed ballots must be received by election day, November 6th. It's never too early to check registration cutoff dates and absentee ballot requests and submission dates in your own state. We highly suggest reviewing your state's important dates and voter ID laws at rockthevote.org as soon as possible to ensure you will be able to vote in the general election. Links to all the information you heard today, as well as additional resources, are linked in the show notes. And today's Midterms Minute, just like every activism segment we produce, is archived and organized under the Activism tab at bestofleft.com. So if making the blue wave a reality in November is important to you, be sure to hit the share buttons to spread the word about supporting Democrats in battleground races across the country via social media so that others in your network can spread the word too. 
Now we have a special feature. The legendary New York restaurateur Danny Meyer talks about the food business. His restaurant, the Union Square Cafe, was a New York City landmark for decades. Now his shake shacks are all over the place. He spoke at the end of October at a dinner organized by the nation in honor of the publication of the magazine's food issue. The event was held at his restaurant at the Whitney Museum. The restaurant is called Untitled. One of the things Danny Meyer talked about was why he's against tipping. I, th I think my uh, thinking on tipping has evolved dramatically in one way and not at all in another way. I wrote an article for the Union Square Cafe newsletter, um, which was the only way I could communicate back in the old days. And the article that I wrote for that was anti-tipping, but for a very different reason than I finally arrived at two years ago, two and a half years ago. Back then, it would just crush me when I would see a waiter in tears because they had been stiffed on a tip mm -hmm. and they thought they had given great service or they had been stiffed on a tip and the food was slow, but they had nothing to do with the food being slow. That was a, you know, an honest problem in the kitchen. Or maybe the guests were from London and they don't have a tipping culture. Or maybe someone was inebriated and they forgot. You, you just never knew. But it, it just always felt horribly. And, and the reason is that the tip was really all they were making because the uh, adjusted minimum wage for tipped employees back then uh, was, I believe, $2.13 an hour. I think what, what was much more moving a couple of years ago was a very different thing. I noticed two and a half years ago that the, the income disparity between cooks and tipped employees had grown dramatically, almost 30 times. And the reason is that it's against the law for tips to be shared with anyone who does not spend 80% of their time in a guest-facing role. You could get brought to court if you were to share tips with the cooks in the kitchen and by the way, why has why that disparity grown? Because a tip is a multiplier of a menu price. And menu prices have gone in one direction. In my career, menu prices have not only gone up dramatically and, and more quickly because of the cost of, of everything, whether it's your rent, whether it's the commodities, whether it's the underlying labor, whether it's the linen, whether it's insurance, health insurance, et cetera. And, and not only has the menu price gone up, but so too has the tip percentage itself. When I opened Union Square Cafe, 15%. So that went up to 17.5% when people said, I got it, let's just double the tax. And then it went up to 20% because mm -hmm. that was even easier math mm -hmm. after a few glasses right. of wine. So that's all good, but what's not good is that the, the cooks in the kitchen can't afford to live in New York. They've, they've been earning about... 30% more today per hour than they were earning in 1985. Then Danny Meyer was asked about the history and politics of tipping. The, the politics behind tipping goes all the way back to the abolition of slavery because the two industries in the United States that successfully petitioned the U.S. government to create dispensation where you would not have to pay your staff or your employees were the restaurant industry for the service staff and the Pullman train car industry, for the porters, because of this little known European bourgeois custom of tipping to show that you had some extra money. Mm. And so what is $2.13 today in this country in approximately, I should know the answer, but let's say something like 40 of the 50 states are still around $2.13 an hour all the way up from zero at the abolition of slavery. More and more states, the, they're, they're saying, why, why should there be, why should restaurants not be responsible for paying everybody? Why should you pay for that? Why should you decide what a waiter is worth? And meanwhile, the, the thing that I said in terms of the hoax is that the economic basis of dining out in this country is completely flawed. 
we have done a fantastic job over 25 years of convincing everyone in this room to pay a little bit more money for properly raised fruits and vegetables. Maybe organic, but at least safe. We, and, and seasonally grown and brought in by your favorite farmer and preserving land as a result. We've also convinced all of us over the last 10 years to pay a little bit more for cage-free eggs or chickens or you know, animals that have been raised with proper husbandry. And it just strikes me as being completely odd that, that the economics of the restaurant experience, and this is harder to break than ever because of the internet, where everyone knows what chicken should cost in a restaurant, <laughs> and there's 26,000 restaurants in New York, so the downward pressure on your ability to price is crazy. And the last thing we're willing to give on is people. The last thing we're willing to pay more money for is people. We just decided that the right thing to do for us is to stop blaming a system that we do not have to, we don't have to sustain that if we don't want to, to stop sustaining a system that in addition to everything I just said, and, and including the disparity between what people can make, is that it's a dead-end drug. I know people, um, including my wife, who I met when she was a, an actress waiting on tables at a seafood restaurant in New York City in 1984. You make good enough money in, in New York. I'm not talking about Denny's and Applebee's where $2.13 and a little pinch right. will get you a good tip. And that's a sad story, but that's true. But you make good enough money in New York as a tipped employee that you end up not pursuing the very reason you came to New York in the first place. And you make good enough money as a tipped employee that you can actually not afford to then become a manager and pursue a career in hospitality if that's what you wanted to do. So we said, screw it. Let's, and I'm going to tell you right now, it's one of the hardest things I think we've ever undertaken as a restaurant empire. Oh, excuse me, collection. <laughs> It's hard, it's hard to get the math right on this, but we want to get to a point where the price you see on the menu is everything. Mm -hmm. There's no extra line to give a gratuity. You don't have to wonder you know, what you should be leaving because you got a bottle of wine worth this much or this much. And I'm really, really proud of, of, of the consumers who have said, let's give this a shot. This show runs on recurring donations from listeners just like you who signed up to support the show on Patreon for as little as a couple bucks a month. We've been working really hard recently to make the show itself, as well as the benefits to patrons, better than ever. As a quick reminder of recent improvements, we increase the number of episodes we produce each month. That's a big one. We produce more bonus episodes for members than before. I've made ad-free versions of every regular episode available at the $2 and up patron level to benefit more people. And now all all patrons get to vote each week on what upcoming topics they want to hear on the show. All of that. Plus, meanwhile, we've been putting together some of the most time and research intensive segments we've ever done in the midterms minutes because we know how important these elections are and we're committed to getting everyone all of the information and encouragement they need to make a difference. All of this has only been possible because we've spent the last year going through trials and errors and constantly strategizing to figure out ways to run this show as efficiently as possible. The work of the show became so overwhelming a year ago that we had to cut down on the production schedule, but I was never happy about that, and I always had the goal of getting the show back to full strength without sacrificing quality, and I think we have finally done that. As you know, all of this work is primarily supported by members who support the show because they get value from it. So if between all of the free and members-only content we produce, you think it's worth a few bucks a month to help keep it going strong, please join up on Patreon and know that any dollar amount really does make a difference. Sign up at patreon.com slash best of left. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash best of left. Thanks so much for your support. Practices, as you've indicated, differ from state to state. There's some variation here, and some employ, I think you sort of referred to it, what they call a tip credit. What 
is going on there? What is a tip credit? Yeah, it's a horrible misnomer, really. Uh, Some of our friends like to call it a tip penalty because it's really a penalty on the worker. Essentially, what some people call a tip credit is an, an employer's ability to discount a worker's wage so that then ultimately they only have to actually pay them as little as $2.13 an hour. They can say, because you're getting tips, I'm going to take this out of your wage so that I don't have to pay you a full wage. I can pay you as little as two thirteen, and the remainder will be made up in tips. That's essentially what a tip credit or a tip penalty is. But, you know, I, I in my first book, Behind the Kitchen Door, I had a story of a young woman who worked at the IHOP in Houston, Texas. And IHOP is a multi-million dollar corporation, should be able to figure this out. But when she started working at the IHOP in Houston, Texas, the manager told her, I don't want to have to be held liable to ensure that tips make up the difference for every hour so that I'm going to report that you're making the full minimum wage of a whopping $7.25 an hour, whether or not you actually do. I don't care what you make in tips. That's what I'm going to report, which means that she's taxed on seven twenty five, dollars even for those hours, and there are many of them in an IHOP, where nobody walks in the door. It's a graveyard shift or it's very slow. It's open all night, right? There are many times when she's folding napkins or filling honey bottles or syrup bottles and not getting anything in tips. Earning two thirteen, which goes completely to taxes, because she's being taxed as if she's earning seven twenty five for every hour that she works. Well, as we discussed with economist Holly Sklar last week, and talking about the minimum wage generally, livable wages aren't just a matter of you know human decency or of economic security for individuals, but also for society as a whole. Right? That's absolutely right. I mean, not just for society as a whole, but for this very industry itself. I mean. What's really sad is over the last couple of years of economic crisis, our industry has grown, but the way it has grown has reflected growing income inequality in our country in that the fine dining restaurants are booming. Fast food is booming. And that middle segment where a lot of America takes their family to eat, the Olive Gardens, the Chili's, that segment has not been growing. It's actually been stagnating compared to the other segments of the industry, which is a direct reflection on how this industry pays its own workers, because this is the largest industry in America. The ability of these workers to actually afford to eat out is what sustains this industry itself. And so paying these workers a better wage would come right back into the industry itself. They would see that direct result if they would actually invest in workers' ability to survive and live and and eat out like the rest of us. Well, you've talked about what you call the Jim Crow in U.S. restaurants that has to do with gender and race sort of stratification. I mean, the truth is, if you've gone to a very expensive restaurant, some folks will notice, hey, all the people serving me are white men. You know, there there is a gender and race element to this that's quite strong. You've talked a lot about the gender, but there are racial elements as well. Oh, Absolutely. People of color and women of color get segregated into lower-level segments of the industry and lower-tipping occupations and lower-paid occupations. You will see people of color in casual restaurants and fast-food restaurants. If they're in fine dining, you'll see them in what we call the back of the house, the kitchen, or in lower-tipped positions like a busser or a runner who often earns one-fifth of the tips that a server will make. And so, you know, when the industry says nobody actually earns two thirteen an hour, these are well-paid tipped workers. Well, there there is a segment of the population for whom that's true. There are these wealthy white servers. I won't even say wealthy, actually. I will say um, better paid white servers who work in fine dining restaurants, and they should be paid a livable wage. They should be remunerated for the professional work that they do. This is a profession. It's a skilled profession, as it's recognized to be in other countries. But a big part of the problem is that people of color are not able to actually get to those great livable wage, fine dining server and bartending positions. Those jobs are not accessible to the vast majority of workers in this industry. So we need to do two things. We need to lift the floor by eliminating the lower wage for tipped workers and raising the wage overall for everybody. And we need to build the ladder. We need to lift the floor and build the ladder so that while we're lifting the floor, we also create much better ability for workers to move into continuously higher paying positions, especially fine dining server and bartending positions, which can be family supporting jobs. 
Right. Everyone knows somebody who makes a great living off tips, you know, but right. the point right. is that people are not equally situated or don't have... Yeah, Most ac- people don't have access to that. Right. Well, let me ask you just what are some of the tipped wages coming to the forefront, but there are other issues that you work on uh, with the Restaurant Opportunity Centers. What are some of the preeminent other things that you think are important to know about the fight? Yeah. There's really three key issues that workers continuously bring up. We surveyed at this point over 6,000 workers nationwide, and the same things keep emerging everywhere. The top is, of course, poverty wages and especially the pit minimum wage. The second is this issue of mobility that you've already touched upon. And so we've really been looking at the issue of racial segregation and gender segregation in our industry. We've done hundreds of what's called match pair audit tests where we send hundreds of pairs of white and people of color applicants into fine dining restaurants to see who gets hired. We found that white applicants have twice the chance of a person of color, even when the person of color has a better resume, you know, in getting one of these fine dining server positions. So we really need to be looking at the kind of training programs that we provide to allow workers of color to get into fine dining service positions. We need to be looking at policy that incentivizes employers to really promote from within and desegregate their restaurants. So that's the second big issue. And the third big issue is, of course, access to benefits, the lack of paid sick days. 90% of workers in this industry don't have a single earned sick day, which means they can't take a day off when they're sick, not just because they can't afford it, but often because they'll be penalized or fired for taking a day off when they're sick, which has tremendous public health implications for all of us as consumers. Also, the lack of access to health care, even post-health care reform in this country, Our industry really led the effort to form a club called the 29ers. I don't know if you or your listeners have heard about this, but Denny's and many other Darden, you know, which is Olive Garden, Capital Girl Steakhouse, formed a kind of association of companies that committed to basically reduce all of their workers' hours to 29, one less than 30, so that they wouldn't be eligible to participate in the exchanges or be part of healthcare reform. So, so many of our workers at this moment are falling through the cracks, perhaps because they're immigrants and can't get access to health care reform, perhaps for other reasons. Uh, so there's still a tremendous lack of health care for our people. And both the lack of paid sick days and the lack of health care has really horrendous consequences for our public health as consumers. Let me just ask you finally, is there something you'd like to see more of or less of in terms of media coverage uh, of this set of issues? Yeah, I really appreciate that question. I really, I really hope that the media can cover this issue of tipping in a more nuanced way that really understand that the first step has to be eliminating the lower wage for tipped workers and that has to be the focus. You know, I think talking about tipping more broadly is sexy and people like to talk about it, but when people are living on literally slave wages of $2.13 an hour and and that it is an actual legacy of slavery, we need to, as a nation, first demand that this industry eliminate this legacy of slavery, and then we can talk about the elimination of tipping. We can support restaurants moving in this direction, however they're doing it. I really hope that the media can make that distinction between those two issues, and in supporting restaurants and profiling restaurants that are moving in this direction, really highlight those that are doing it right like Danny Meyer, who did it in a very transparent way and is committed to actually ensuring that without tips, his workers are going to make the same thing in wages that they would have made in tips. That's what we would want to see of anybody following. So we know a lot of restaurants are going to jump on this bandwagon of eliminating tipping. And if we all understand that the most important thing is what our workers actually being paid, then it shouldn't be about tips or no tips. It should be about determining what is a restaurant actually paying their workers. There are multitudes contained within the world, right? There are reasons that Hooters restaurants are very successful. There are people for whom uh, how um, a a chef treats its staff doesn't matter necessarily. If the food's good, they don't care. I mean, I think they probably wouldn't want to go to a restaurant where there were, you know, serial murders of children. But uh, a chef who 
you know, touches the breasts regularly of his, you know, of, of women in his circle? Eh, I don't know. So, you know, it depends. I do know uh, that um, certainly business was down around the holidays. This broke, a lot of this broke in December. And uh, I know that they got, there were several corporate parties that got canceled because um, at that level, when you're looking at a corporate um, uh, function, you don't want to be uh, at all uh, associated with a, a restaurant group that has a history of sexual abuse or harassment from its leadership. So I think it, you know, I think corporations are much more sensitive to this than they ever were before. Some individual diners will never go there again, um, and others, I think, couldn't care less. So we've had these big blowups. They obviously haven't just been in New York. They've been in other markets, New Orleans, the Bay Area, um, mostly in high-end sort of white tablecloth chains. Do you think that there's been an inflection point where the, you know these issues of sort of toxic masculinity in the kitchen and cultures that harbor harassment um, are going to be on the way out? Or are we looking at a moment where there's a couple of high profile sort of sacrifices and then, you know, things go back to normal, you know, diners keep going to these restaurants, you know, maybe in a year, the wait is back to two hours, um, things get um, swept under the rug. Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, these things have a lot of layers. So, uh, and one take is that indeed this was a reckoning. I think things will never be the same again. Uh, thankfully, I think there was a big cultural shift that has happened. Um, but that being said, social change takes time. You know, um, uh, I think when, you know, uh, John Lewis and Martin Luther King walked across the Selma Bridge in Alabama, and got uh, the crap beat out of them, one would think, my God, look at this. This has got to change. It took, you know, it, 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 we are still struggling with racial inequality in this country. So these things take time. It's sort of like, um, I think you got to look at it like there was this woods and there was, there, was no, there was no path through the woods. Now, you know, we've cut a good path, maybe uh, put some stone on it. It's a little easier, I think, for someone, for a woman to walk from, uh, you know, a kitchen where she's getting harassed to an HR department or perhaps feels empowered enough to go find a different job and not feel stuck in a place to, you know, we'll have some support when she or when a man on the line sees some sexist behavior and we'll call it out. I think uh, certainly the high end, you know, with, with fame and money comes, I think, sometimes a predilection to do worse, you know, uh, more. I think you could get away with more egregious behavior. Um, I think the men who thought they could get away with stuff are maybe not doing it because they don't want to be in the newspaper. So maybe that's a change. Um, I think, you know, my editors are much more willing to uh, entertain stories about inequity. You know, we did, just did a big package on tipping and and kind of the difficulties of um, that relationship in which um, a, a server is kind of set up to be sexually harassed by some customers because there's that implied money exchange, like, let me flirt with you a little bit, and the waitress might flirt back, and then they're going to get a better tip. And there's that inherent, um, you know, kind of slight sexualized relationship in some cases in tipping. Um, and, and you know, people, the Waffle House waitresses and, you know, I mean, from the bottom to the top, know that dance. And my editors, I think, would have never been that interested in um, what waitresses have to put up with to get tips as a story, as a a major story. But they, the paper put a lot of resources behind a story about just getting women's stories about what it's like to be on the other end of that tipping arrangement. So those kinds of things changed and I think have, will continue to be, um, you know, more relevant. Um, But do I think that men will stop behaving badly in kitchens and women will not speak up and, you know, that it's all over? I don't think so. (laughs) 
often talk about raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour, which is the widespread calculation of a living wage in many cities. What many of us don't realize, and I didn't realize until I began digging more into this yesterday, is that there is a minimum wage and then there's a tipped minimum wage. The tipped minimum wage applies to servers and bartenders as well as other tipped workers. And the tipped minimum wage is often far, far lower than the regular minimum wage. The idea is that servers and others are supposed to make up the difference between the tips and the regular minimum wage with their tips and that if they don't make up the difference, employees will cover it. But as we know, policy in theory often doesn't work out the intended way in practice. For example, in D.C. where Clint and I live, uh, the minimum wage is twelve fifty an hour. It will rise to $15 an hour by 2020. But the tipped minimum wage is only three thirty three an hour and will rise to five dollars an hour by twenty twenty. Um, tipped wages, as you can imagine, are completely unpredictable. You think about the different seasons of tourism, the region that you work in, or the restaurant type, your tips will completely fluctuate with the interest in your establishment. For women, there's often an even greater risk uh, because women earning a tipped minimum wage are often not only told to accept sexual harassment and other kinds of harassment so they don't lose their tips, but often actually seek out sexual attention so that they can increase their wages, even if an employer does not protect them from people who cross boundaries and lines. Obviously, women have full agency, but we have to recognize the double standard that men are often not placed in these highly vulnerable positions when they're in the same industry. And then what you think on top of that about the risk of reporting sexual harassment and assault for women who work uh, in the restaurant industry, that risk is even greater. So if you report something and you are fired or you experience retribution and you feel like you have to switch jobs, switching jobs can often mean a delay in your paychecks, which can mean harm to your children and inability to feed your family. And a lot of people just cannot afford that time in between. Moreover, as reported by American Prospect, they said many Many restaurant workers are also pressured to sign non-disclosure agreements that prevent them from addressing or acknowledging hostile work environments. Often they're non-union workers without the protections of collective bargaining and working for low wages. Going through the appropriate legal avenues is often costly, and workers will sign such agreements in return for monetary settlements while employees are able to keep allegations confidential and, as you can imagine, keep these kind of hostile environments going without any retribution. Um, and so in D.C., there's an initiative called Initiative 77 that would end the two-tier approach and just create a universal minimum wage by 2026. That's not to say that Rock United or any other activist groups are against tipping, but it is to say that that two-tiered system is often harming people and often harming women even more. Brittany, I'm really glad you brought this up um, because I think it's something that a lot of people don't know. I think a lot of folks don't know that there is a a difference between um, the minimum wage, uh, the sort of standard minimum wage, and then the tip minimum wage. I found this out a couple of years ago um, from the same organization. It was an important revelation in many ways. And, and when you put it in conversation with the fact in all of the sort of uh, research that has been done that shows that uh, black servers are tipped less than their white counterparts, even when it is controlled for the quality of the service, right? So um, there's a study done in 2014 by Zachary Brewster and Michael Lynn, and it showed that not only are black waiters and black servers tipped less than their white counterparts, you know, because somebody could come back and say, oh, well, that's because, you know, this is all also racist. But they could say, you know, they're not of the same quality as their white counterparts. So in this study, what they did was control for the quality of the service. And when they did that, the results were um, enhanced, right? The, the sort of difference between the white servers and the black servers, uh, the, the stratification of tipping pay grew rather than was attenuated, um, which is also really interesting and, and really concerning. Um and, and that across the board, almost the same way that last week we talked about how people will talk about black people not having personal responsibility, um, but we save at higher rates than our white counterparts. Um, the quality of the servers sort of across the board um, for black servers was rated at a higher level than their white counterparts. There are a couple of things that I'll say. One is that this two-tiered system of the minimum wage came at the end of the Civil War as a way to hire newly freed slaves without paying them the base wage. And like the goal was to create a permanent servant class, which is interesting, but the people who are against the, the proposed initiative in DC 
their sort of push is that like if there's just one minimum wage and it'll lead to fewer restaurant jobs, that the menu prices will have to be higher and things like that. But what we know to be true is that there are seven states already that have eliminated the tip wage and have like one basic minimum wage. Those states are California, Oregon, Washington, Alaska, Nevada, Montana, and Minnesota. In, in those states, it actually hasn't borne out that there are going to be less jobs, that menu prices have to go up, that we actually can uh, we can afford equity, that that is a good business model, too. And the third piece is when you think about employment, a lot of people think about the importance of getting a job, that like we need to make sure un- like people who don't have jobs get jobs. But the reality is, is if, if you get a job that is just a poverty job, then that like isn't necessarily a win. So if you get a job where you're making $3 an hour, you're not able to to like pay your bills. You're not able to make a set of choices that actually allow you to move about and navigate in society in a way that actually has choices. So the goal isn't just to get people jobs. The goal is to get people jobs that actually equip them with a different set of options and a different set of choices that they can make. And that requires that there's mobility. Indeed. I will just end with reminding us that this is exactly why intersectionality matters. We've been having conversations about Me Too. We've been having much needed conversations about women's pay equity. And it's easy to talk only about women in Hollywood or women in quote unquote white collar professions and how difficult it is. And those challenges are all real. But we have to recognize just how much more vulnerable um, people are when they they do not uh, make salaries, consistent salaries, when they do not have the kind of economic privilege, racial privilege, or privilege of high visibility um, that many people that we pay attention to do have. Uh, we have to consider how much more difficult it is for wage earners and women wage earners in particular. Karen Leibowitz and her husband co-founded two beloved Bay Area restaurants, Mission Chinese and more recently, The Perennial. Karen was really troubled by all the sexual harassment scandals in the news, so she decided to figure out how to prevent it from happening in the first place. She has a few ideas, and one has to do with how to protect her servers from creepy customers. At our restaurants, we have a, a system where if a customer is inappropriate with a server, then that server just kind of taps out and a different server takes over that table. Usually our biggest, scariest looking guy. That tactic resembles one taken by a chef over in Oakland. Tara Duggan of the San Francisco Chronicle told us more about that. So I've been working on a story that has been much more uplifting than the other stories about harassment, which is uh, a restaurant also in Oakland. It's actually very close to Pizza Yolo in, um, it's called Home Room. They specialize, they actually only really serve macaroni and cheese of many different kinds. And they also have around, well, they have a hundred employees because it's a super popular restaurant. They have a to go, um, and catering business too. It's owned by a woman named Erin Wade. She used to be an employment lawyer, so she's really excited about teaching her staff about harassment. She promotes women to management positions, so she thought she was doing everything right, and then she found out some of her staff were having a real problem with harassment by by customers. And at first I was surprised because I thought, it's like a mac and cheese restaurant. It's not a bar, you know, and you don't think of. But uh, there were some problems, and they – they came up with this really interesting system where they basically leave it up to the server to decide if they're feeling uncomfortable, but with a customer, they have a color coded system where the server just has to say yellow, orange, or red to their manager. They don't have to explain what happened because everybody's different, right? Like for some people, if they just get a bad vibe from someone who, or maybe someone's staring at them and, They just don't feel comfortable around that person. They can say yellow and then they can choose to not serve that table anymore or they could just ask the manager to keep an eye on that table for them. Um, If it's a worse situation, for example, if someone's kind of coming on to you a little bit or making all these compliments and trying to get into your space, um, it's orange and then the manager automatically 
takes over your table so you don't have to deal with that person. And if it's a really bad situation, it's red and they get kicked out of the restaurant. And Karen has a few ideas about how to discourage bad behavior in the kitchen. Here's Kira and Karen again. You suggested a few months back that restaurants might hang up a poster basically about how not to sexually harass your coworkers, um, like the same idea as those posters about how to save someone who's choking. Um, have you drafted that poster yet? I have. Um, I've drafted the language and I've been working with a designer and I am currently waiting for a lawyer to review it and make sure that the advice given is correct and <laughs> um, wise. But the the way that I started thinking about it was really that so many of the stories that we hear in the restaurant industry are of people um, feeling powerless, um, particularly when um, management does not respond to their concerns. Um, and I thought, well, there are resources and, and people need to be connected with those resources. So it really literally says like what to do in case of sexual harassment. And it's like, these are the steps that you can take. Um, and it's a, um, a message to anyone who sees the poster that, um, they have allies and, uh, some pointers for how to reach them. You have not hung your poster yet at your restaurant because you're still having it reviewed by lawyers. But And one of the things that you mentioned about um, doing there is uh, having, you know, if somebody feels harassed by a customer, then they tap out. Um, what are some other things that you do there that you think might be replicable at other restaurants? Well, um, at our restaurant, we have... Um, those kinds of affirmative declarations of our values within the staff community, you know, so not speaking to the customer with a sign, but, you know, we have meetings where, um, you know, I'll gather the whole kitchen and say, um, as you know, there have been a lot of stories of restaurants with very bad behavior. And I want you to know that if you ever experience something like that or witness something like that, I want to know. I want you to tell me so that we can deal with it. Um, don't think that I'm going to sweep it under the rug because I really I want to have a, a kitchen culture that's good for everyone. Um, and then um, our chef... Mike, uh, Michael Andreata said, yeah, and if you're doing it, like, I will, like, kick you out that day, like, don't ever do it, you know, so like, my experience, <laughs> my orientation was to speak to people who have suffered um, sexual harassment and say, like, I'm here for you. And his was to say, uh, to people who could be doing it, like, quit it, don't do that. So we kind of came at it from both sides. Um, and then, you know, I also noticed in um, some of the news reports about, for example, um, Four Barrel, the coffee um, roaster in San Francisco, that a lot of bad behavior circulated around staff parties. And so, or that, that those were um, kind of occasions for bad behavior. And so in advance of our holiday party, which we had in January, because we're in the restaurant industry, I, you know, wrote the invitation and said, like, let's all have fun and not touch each other inappropriately. You know, like, just, <laughs> I kind of wanted to keep it light, but also to say, like, these are the moments that you want to really be your best self, you know, like, make, set your intention <laughs> to not be a sexual harasser as we go into the holiday party, right? And then we had a great time and I don't think anything bad happened. You know, um, the other thing going on in our restaurant is um, that we have a pretty even split between um, male and female um, managers. So um, I think we have made it clear that you can talk to any of us um, and uh, if there's a problem, you know, if you feel more comfortable with this type of manager or that type of manager, um, and that we all are responsive. Um, I also had to fire someone for sexual harassment about six months ago. 
Um, and, you know, we were very open about it to the rest of the staff, you know, like, this is why he ha- had to leave. Um, so all of those things are just sort of setting the culture that we want. More than 2,500 women have contacted the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund, which was, of course, premiered. It started right around the Golden Globes when there's the big blackout. More than 300 heavy hitters in Hollywood uh, came out and said, "We time is up on sexual harassment. We started this legal defense fund, the goal of which was to not only address sexual harassment and sexual assault in kind of she-she workplaces, Hollywood style, but also to help working class women um, address sexual harassment and abuse in their workplaces. Right, because they're actually at greater risk for when they lose their jobs or when they're kind of polarized, they they have no skills or resources to kind of come back from that. There's no money, there's no big pile of money, there's no big high-powered lawyer to help them. They're going to be jobless and they're going to be on the in the hot seat. Exactly. So sexual harassment is really, really prevalent in food service and in service industries. And when you think about the the fact that these women are in a position of extreme vulnerability, not just in the workplace where they don't necessarily have a person that they can go to, but also just in, in your life. You know, when you're working a food service job and you're making 11 bucks an hour and you maybe have a kid, or if you don't have a kid, you're maybe caring for another relative mm-hmm. or you have a car that keeps breaking down. You know, the... When you think about the stakes for reporting your manager for sexual harassment, like you know you're going to get fired. You're right. probably going to get actually, fired. And the, actually, the, there were 10, so female cooks and cashiers at McDonald's, um, along with the financial support of the Times Up Defense Fund, and they've also teamed up with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, have filed 10 charges now with McDonald's about sexual harassment in the workplace. And um, they're calling, among the things that they want to change is that they're calling for zero tolerance for any kind of sexual harassment and mandatory training for managers and all employees Mm. at McDonald's. I love that. And I have to say, this is such an exciting turn of events when it comes to kind of the next steps in the Me Too movement, right? Where we're kind of used to, you know, when, when guys first started falling, it was like, well, none of these guys are ever going to see the inside of a jail cell. None of these right. guys are ever going to get sentenced. None of these guys are ever going to have any lasting consequences beyond just like some short-term social pain. And so we're used to not being able to trust criminal justice because sexual harassment doesn't, there's not a wealth of evidence around sexual harassment. It's always a he said, she said, she said, she said, she said, she said. Right, and even when there is a little bit of uh, evidence, sometimes people still don't believe the person who has the evidence. Exactly, and as we just said with Rachel Crooks, when you come forward, even if you're believed and even if the guy gets removed from his position of authority, whether he's a famous multimillionaire stand-up comic or yeah. the manager at McDonald's, you are still gonna be paying a very high price You're for always gonna forward. be identified to that person. I mean, let's just talk about Monica Lewinsky for a second oh because Monica Lewinsky and that, that there's a little more nuance in that situation, but Monica Lewinsky will forever be tied to the, the the scandal with Bill Clinton. Absolutely. And even though we are really proud of her for reinventing herself and and coming back out and saying like I own my life, I own my name, I own my story. There's a lot to, that's valuable about me that has nothing to do with him and I believe her completely and I'm here for her completely. Monica, I love you. I know. Katie, yeah. Katie, I love her too. You know. I yeah, for so much. Um, but I, I think what's so interesting about this approach with Time's Up is that they're kind of sidestepping criminal justice. They're like, we're not going to try to get these managers at McDonald's in prison. We're not going to try to put them in jail. What we're going to try to do is put the corporations in the position of having to be responsible for creating a culture where women know they can come forward about these things without fear of retribution mm-hmm. or being fired, where this behavior is just flat out fucking unacceptable. It's going to be in the rule book, in the in the employee handbook. This, 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 this is not tolerated. If this happens, this is what's going to happen. There are repercussions because it must be a little too ambiguous for some people, and I say that with sarcasm, <laughs> to understand that they shouldn't whip out their penis by the fryer and that they shouldn't maybe talk about the lurid dreams they've had about an employee while she's flipping the burgers. This this actually happened to someone. And, you know, the other thing that's interesting about this is that 
In a way, I'm surprised that, like you were saying before about your surprise that things haven't happened sooner with a black woman being nominated for governor, governor um, for the Democratic Party. But the other thing that I'm surprised by is why don't people get $15 minimum wage when they're working in these jobs? Well, that and, is an excellent question. Right, and yeah. Time's Up is teaming up with the Fight for $15 movement um, for these jobs because all of this movement can come together. And if they, if the Time's Up for women in these positions can actually join with the $15 momentum, then maybe something will get done. We've just heard clips today starting with Splinter explaining the racist history of tipping. Counterspin spoke with Saru Jayuraman in two parts about her campaign to outlaw the tipped minimum wage. Start Making Sense highlighted the comments of restaurateur Danny Meyer about the trouble with tipping. The Bite podcast, in two parts, discussed the sexual harassment rampant in the restaurant industry and what some restaurateurs are doing to combat it. Pod Save America explained some of the gender and racial implications of the tip minimum wage. And finally, we just heard Messy Malfi Mandatory discuss the connection between the Time's Up campaign and the fight for 15. As always, you can find links to each of these segments in the show notes for easy reference and sharing. And now, we'll hear from you. Hi, this is Catherine from Bloomington, Illinois. I am usually behind on listening to your episodes just because I'm busy, but I just listened to your healthcare one. Um, I have a little bit of a unique perspective as I'm an ophthalmologist, and the first episode talked was talking about eye drops and how the evil pharmaceutical company on purpose withheld an eye drop because it containing a, a perfect dosage and really the pharmaceutical company wants you to waste the, the medications and use them up more quickly. But that's not really the true story. To be honest, the eye drop bottle failed because many of my elderly patients with glaucoma couldn't really squeeze the bottle. They made it so difficult to squeeze one little tiny drop out that was the perfect dosage that Many of the patients would squeeze more than one drop out because they couldn't squeeze it. They felt that they didn't hit their eye. They didn't get enough. It's a perpetual problem with glaucoma drops. The main problem with them is that frequently the patients run out of them before the end of the month and the pharmaceutical company that they have as their drug plan will not refill it until they, in theory, have used 30 days worth of the drop. But many patients with Parkinson's and other issues miss their eye, use up the drop, and often are, you know, five to six days from the end of the month, they've run out and they can't refill it without costing them extra money. So that's the main problem. There are some evil pharmaceutical companies, one uh, that recently sold their patent of Restasis, which is a dry eye medication to a Indian reservation or in, as a sovereign nation, they thought that they would get away with continuing their sole proprietary use of the Restasis drug and that no other generics could be made. So that's, that's sort of a big thing. And hopefully you'll look that up and, and research that because that was uh, quite an interesting thing. But a, a judge just ruled against them. And so now Restasis can be made as a generic. On the second episode, regarding the uh, gentleman who thinks that doctors should be paid based on keeping patients healthy, well, we're already sort of in that. It's sort of a, the corporatization of medicine. Uh, there's something called MIPS and MACRA, Merit Based Incentive Payment System, and the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act of 2015. Those are, are trying to incentivize results over um, payments. But mostly it's been counting. It's not really, I don't think, adding tremendous value to things. It's causing us to buy computer equipment and try to monitor a lot of things that we didn't before. It's 
rather silly. The other issue with that, of course, is that, you know, if we're, we're going to pay doctors based on outcomes, many doctors will probably not take on the worst patients who have will have poor outcomes regardless of what we do. And that can be a problem as well. So, um, and many patients have uh, diseases that have nothing to do with what we do and what the patient does. Uh, my son, for example, at the age of 13 had a cancerous tumor that had nothing to do with anything he did. So it's just one of those things that um, should happen. And uh, as I tell my patients who ask me, well, doctor, why did I have this disease? I say, well, you didn't pick your parents correctly. So anyway, that's my two cents. Bye, Jay. Love what you do. Bye. Hi, Jay. It's Aaron from Philly. I took a break from listening to podcasts for a couple of months, so I've been catching up on a couple of recent episodes. I wanted to thank you for your final comments on the Arguing Your Values episode and for the inclusion of the Van Jones segment. When I first started to listen to the episode, I thought, oh boy, here we go again. Another white guy with a TED Talk telling marginalized people that all they need to do is understand the other side a little bit better, because after all, aren't they just as scared of us? It's something that drives me really crazy about the left sometimes. TYT can be really guilty of this too, saying things like, well, we should just hear Milo out and not try to protest him, when he specifically calls out trans people in his audience for violence. Anyway, the both-siderism of they're just as scared of us as we are of them didn't sit well with me. But Van Jones laid out a good way to interrogate our own values while still managing to point out that conservatives need to interrogate just about everything they've been doing the last 20 years. And I appreciated your recipe for not getting caught in a media bubble. I don't have to seek out articles from the American Conservative, which frequently posts anti-trans articles and opinion pieces. Instead, I can look for something a little bit to the right, say mainstream news, and a little bit to the left, say a actual communist publication, and not get stuck in my little democratic socialist world, period. This is definitely a tendency I've seen among friends of mine on the left. Granted, they started out from a position further left than I am, but even something that I would consider well to my left, like Jacobin, is unforgivably to the right for them. I'm not even sure they have any news sources outside of online discourse, and... I just don't see how that's a good way to get through the world. Long story short, as always, keep up the good work and thanks for everything you do. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks to the volunteers who helped gather clips to make this show possible. Thanks to Amanda Hoffman for all of her work on our social media outlets and activism segments. And thanks to all those who called into the voicemail line. If you'd like to leave a comment or question of your own to be played on the show, you can simply record a message at 202-999-3991. Now today, I'm going to talk about something completely off topic in a totally different direction than I usually go. Uh, nothing to do with politics, nothing to do with the content of the show. Uh, I have some technical uh, information about how the show works that may very well improve your life. So from the very beginning, I have been one of the very few podcasters who takes advantage of uh, what's called chapter markers for my show. Most shows, they don't do it. It, it uh, It's extra work for them. 
the format of their show doesn't really lend itself to needing chapter markers, so it doesn't make sense to put in the extra effort anyway. And I've always felt that it has been worth the extra effort for me to put in the chapter markers because of the nature of the show itself being divided into very distinct segments. And uh, and so chapter markers allow listeners to skip around in the show if they want skip past things maybe they've already heard listening somewhere else, even skip backwards to re-listen to something they just heard, and so on. So uh, chapter markers have been part of the show from the very beginning, but not everyone has uh, been able to access them because it depends on the device you use to listen as to whether or not you get to see the chapter markers. Now, support for chapter markers has been growing over time, so more and more people have been able to access them, but uh, there's been a major development in this last week, and you know, I, I usually don't get into tech news or uh, talk about being excited about the release of new operating systems of any kind, uh, but this is an exception because the most recent uh, release of the operating system for the iPhone includes a version of Apple Podcasts that now supports chapter markers in a way that is far more broad than before. So if you weren't aware, Apple Podcasts is the gigantic gorilla in the room in terms of podcast consumption. Something like at least 50% of people listen using that one app, even though there are dozens of other choices, uh, many of which I think are better than Apple Podcasts, but it comes pre-installed on iPhones. People use it. They think it works just fine. And, and so lots of people use Apple Podcasts. And, and so that app supporting chapter markers in a new way, which I could get into in lots of boring and complicated detail, but won't. The fact that they're supporting chapter markers in this new way uh, is going to simultaneously simplify my life and potentially improve yours. So it's it's a win-win all around. So it's exciting and, and worth noting. So for those complicated and technical reasons I'm not going to get into, you may have been using Apple Podcasts and already seen chapter markers in there. But for many of you, you could have been using Apple Podcasts and not seen the chapter markers in there. And so the exciting news is that for you, when you upgrade to uh, it's iOS 12, I believe, once you uh, load up your Apple Podcasts app, you will now see chapter markers there. Now, to see them, you just sort of scroll up when the show is playing and taking over the full screen, you sort of scroll up. And the first thing you'll see is show notes, and you can hide or show more of the show notes. And the second thing you'll see is the chapter markers. So use them, enjoy them. I, I do the extra work to put them there for a reason. Uh, so that that's just for the huge chunk of you who listen via Apple Podcast. For everyone else, if you don't know that chapter markers are there or you don't currently see them or don't have access to them, I, I'll, I'll give you a couple of tips. For Android users, I am fairly certain that AntennaPod and Podcast Addict uh, both incorporate uh, chapter markers on the iOS side for uh, iPhones. I'm fairly certain that Downcast, iCatcher, Instacast 4, Sleekcast, uh, my go-to app, Overcast, and now Apple Podcasts, as I've been saying, all support them. And then unfortunately, I have to say that uh, Spotify, the new kid on the block uh, who, who's come on to the podcast scene in a very big way, unfortunately does not support chapter markers, and neither does Stitcher, which is another big one that people love, but unfortunately they don't support chapter markers. So if you're interested in using chapter markers uh, for this show, and, I'm, and there are plenty of out there who also do chapter markers, um, not not a huge percentage, but you know they're out there. Uh, so if, if if you have interest in using those, just make sure you use a podcast listening app or a piece of software that supports it. And what you want to look for if you're doing your own search and you want to try to find an app uh, that supports them, what you want to look for is support for MP3 chapter markers. That's the technical detail you need to narrow it down to the apps that support uh, the right kind of chapter markers, the MP3 chapter markers. So thanks for indulging me and, and nerding out on podcast tech in this one rare instance. Uh, I, I just want to make sure that people are getting as much value as they can out of the show. And I know that chapter markers really add a lot of value for people who use them. And so I just want to make sure that everyone knows they're there 
and knows how to access them if they want them. So that's going to be it for today. Keep the comments coming in at 202-999-3991. Thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks to those who support the show by becoming a member or making donations of any size at patreon.com slash best of left, as that is absolutely how the program survives. Of course, everyone can support the show just by telling everyone you know about it and leaving us glowing reviews on Apple Podcasts and Facebook to help others find the show. For details on the show itself, including links to all of the sources and music used in this and every episode, all that information can always be found in the show notes on the blog and likely right on the device you're using to listen. So coming to you from far outside the conventional wisdom of Washington, D.C., my name is Jay, and this has been the Best of a Left podcast, coming to you every Tuesday and Friday, thanks entirely to the members and donors to the show from bestofaleft.com. Thank you.